Welcome, good evening, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to continue our Bible study in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Uh, we did part of it last week, and hopefully we'll be able to finish the rest of it this week. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll jump into the Bible study. Father, <clears throat> we thank you tonight for gathering us and just giving us your word to uh, study, to go through, to learn from. And I pray that we will learn from you and that we would understand your heart, Lord, that you would just give us ears to hear what you want to say to us, things that will uh, impact our hearts and lives for today, Lord. And I just thank you for all that you're doing. I just pray you bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Luke 22 is where we're at. We are um, in the last week of Jesus' life. We're on the way to the, the crucifixion. Uh, at this point. And Jesus, last week we spent a lot of time going over a Seder meal or a Passover meal and sort of some of the uh, understanding of what exactly that is. If you missed that and you want to know more about that, listen to the study. And then I also attached uh, a comment uh, and a link um, with a Seder dinner that you could go to and you could watch uh, a Seder dinner that was hosted at, a, I think, Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas. Uh, and so uh, if you want to know more about that, do that. But Jesus did this Seder dinner, this Passover dinner, and he instituted the communion thing. He said, when you eat this bread, as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. He said, when you take the, the cup, this is now to, to be a remembrance of uh, my blood, which was shed for you. And so... Um, <clears throat> Jesus instituted that. And then the disciples got into this argument about who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus explained to them that the greatest in the kingdom is actually the one who is the least. The greatest servant is the one who is greatest in the kingdom. Um, and Peter, as they're beginning to talk, and Jesus says that, that, it, that, they're, that he gives Peter this warning uh, in this conversation. And says that Satan has asked for him. And Jesus said, but I've prayed for you, which is awesome. And we know that Jesus continues to pray for us, but he didn't pray that Peter might escape temptation or Peter might escape the sifting, but rather that Peter's faith would not fail and that when he returned, that he would strengthen the brethren. And so that's, uh, Peter gives us this, well, we'll just read it. In verse 33, it says, of uh, chapter 22 it says but he said to them lord i am ready to go with you both to prison and to death then he said i tell you peter the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me that you know deny three times that you know me and so peter says hey i'm not gonna fail after jesus says satan's asked to sift you and i've prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail peter's got this pride and he's just kind of boasting hey i'm ready to die with you i'll go with you to death i'll go with you to prison and jesus says to him peter you're going to deny me three times before the rooster grows and peter you know i i wonder what he would have been thinking at that point in time was he heartbroken was he sort of angry that Jesus said these things and kind of mumbling? How could he say these kinds of things? I've been with him all along. I'm, you know, I'm, I've been loyal and all these things. And how, how could he say that? But Peter was always one who was, as you read through the Gospels, he was always quick to speak. And sometimes he said these really amazing things. You know, where else would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, right? And he's, and he's like, wow, listen to those answers Peter gave. But then other times he's like when, when they're on the Mount of Transfiguration, oh, Lord, we should build a tent for Moses and one for Elijah and one for you. And in the middle of speaking, he gets cut off by the voice of God who says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And then when Peter looks up, it's just Jesus only. And so... Uh, Peter had this way of just like sort of saying whatever's on his mind. I can relate to Peter a lot. I'm a guy like that. I say what's on my mind. Uh, sometimes I put my foot in my mouth and wish I hadn't said what was on my mind. 
other times it's like manna from heaven coming out of my mouth right honey no but uh, sometimes you say things in in the spur of the moment it's like right on point and other times it's like oh man i wish i would have just thought for a moment before i spoke but peter was is going to grow and and we know the story we know peter ultimately does deny jesus we're going to get to that tonight hopefully but he grows from these mistakes that he makes and later on it, what jesus prayed for him and when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. Well, if you read the rest of the story through the book of Acts and the first and second epistles of Peter, that's exactly what he does. He goes on to strengthen the brethren. His faith doesn't fail. And so Jesus' prayer was answered. But now verse 35, it says, And he, that would be Jesus, said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. And so you remember when Jesus sent them out on a mission trip back uh, earlier in the gospel, he sent them out and he said, don't take anything with you. Just go with whatever you have on your back. Don't take extra money. Don't take extra clothing. Don't take extra food. Just go out and do the ministry. And we, we talked about it at that time that he wanted them to learn a lesson that God is fully capable of taking care of his servants. But now he's telling them, like it says in verse 36 or verse 35, they say, he asked them, did you lack anything? They say, no, we didn't have nothing, Lord. We didn't lack anything. Then verse 36, but now, Jesus tells them, things are changing, in other words. And I, and I, I don't think Jesus is telling them, pack up everything you have, account for every last thing and in, in, um, scenario that could potentially take place. But take what you need to survive, right? And uh, this is essentially like common sense survival. You need money, take some money. You need a bag of clothes, take some bag, take a bag of clothes. You need a sword for protection, bring a sword, right? And so uh, I think as we look at this, there is provision and protection are both being allotted for here by Jesus. And so... Again, there is still the responsibility for a servant of the Lord to trust the Lord, but we also have to do the things on the day-to-day -day that go to work to provide for our families. You know, if you, if you feel like you need protection for your house by a gun, right, don't bring, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. If you're going to, or a bat, get a gun. But uh, <clears throat> shotgun that shoots out 12-gauge buckshot's the best home protection there is. So, uh and, and Jesus, lots of prayer. But, but, in but this is what he's telling them. Like he's saying essentially just if, you, if you're going to have the need to protect yourself, remember these guys were going to be out on the road. It's well known and documented that during these times that there were certain places that they would travel that robbers and thieves would come along and would try to rip you off or kill you to take what you have. So there may be a need for that type of protection. Um, he's certainly not saying use a sword take a sword when you're going out sharing the gospel and bludgeon people into submitting to the kingdom of God. That's not what Jesus is saying. And so they apparently find two swords. Hey, look, Lord, we've got two swords. And Jesus is like, oh, evade, right? This, this, that's enough. Stop talking about this. And so coming out, where are they coming out from? Where were they? The Last Supper, they were in the upper room having the Passover meal. The other Gospels tell us that, and I think it's Matthew that tells us that they sang a hymn, which was traditional with the last cup of the Passover meal, that they would have that last cup and they would sing a hymn and then they would <clears throat> go out or that would be sort of the end of the dinner party. And don't think hymn like Amazing Grace, they were singing the Psalms uh, at that time. And um, so coming out, now they're leaving. And remember what's happening at this point. 
Judas, as you read through the full gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I would encourage you to do that because as you begin to read all of the different accounts, you get a well-rounded, a complete picture of what's going on in the story because you're getting all these different viewpoints and they're each giving you a little different perspective of the whole. And so you get to put them together and sort of like I think of my time as a police officer and I would go on scene at a traffic accident and you would have, say, uh, a person who was waiting at the corner to cross the street who witnessed the accident and they would give you one perspective. And then you have the driver in the accident. They would give you a different perspective. And then you have maybe somebody else who was sitting on the other side of the intersection in a car and they give you a different perspective. And when you get all of the different perspectives, you can put together a pretty clear picture of what happened in that intersection that led to that accident. And so similar to that with the Gospels, if you read all of the accounts, you get a more clear picture of what was going on. So we're told in the other Gospels that at one point, Judas... They're asking, who's it going to be that betrays you, Lord? And he says, the one who dips with me and dips his bread with me in the thing. And, you know, Judas at that time is probably like, you know, but the disciples all begin to ask, well, who is it? Who is it, Lord? And then at that point, Jesus tells Judas what you're going to do, get up and go do it. And it says that Judas gets up and leaves, but the other disciples are like, oh, he must be going to get more food for dinner. He must be getting more supplies for our meal. They're like so blinded by Judas that they don't even realize that Jesus literally just called them out and then told them to go and do what he's going to do. And they're like, not, they don't get it. And as they go out, Judas is not with them. And I wonder in my own mind that if they're like, well, where's Judas? He's not going to know where we're going, right? Like, but maybe he did because it says they went where they were accustomed to. So they get up, it says coming out. He went to the Mount of Olives, notice, as he was accustomed, and his disciples who also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done." And so, again, the other, the other disciples tell us that as they leave, they have to cross over the, the brook Kidron in order to get over to this garden. And it doesn't name it here in Luke, but this is the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, Gethsemane means olive press or pressing. In it. So this was an olive garden um, where they would have olive trees, not, not Italian food. Right. But they would have they would have olive trees and that they would have these presses out in the olive grove and they would pick the olives and press them right there in the field. And it's my understanding that that's actually what is considered to be extra virgin olive oil. It's olives that are pressed right in the field off the tree and the oil is made right there as opposed to taking a harvest back to a factory and pressing them. And that's just regular olive oil, I guess. But if you want the extra virgin olive oil, it's the kind that was done in right there on the field. <clears throat> and that's what was happening at this Garden of Gethsemane. It was an olive grove. I don't know if they had any other kind of plants or whatever there, but the, the pressing would be done right there. And it's kind of an interesting place. If you think about it, this is where Jesus is going to pray right before he is going to be crucified. There's going to be a spiritual pressing, if you will. But just like with the, the olive oil is indicative in the scripture, a type of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus is pressed, what comes out of him is obedience to the Father. And then you think, what happens when I get pressed? What comes out of me? Frustration, anger, irritation, right? Or is it? good stuff like comes out of Jesus, right? That's what we want. That's what we should be aiming for. And Jesus gives us some clues here how to have that happen in our own lives. Because I don't think there's any Christian who deals with frustration or anxiety or struggles and depression and these things that wants that type of overflow in their life. I think everybody who is a Christian would say, 
I want to have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, self-control, right? I want all of those things to be flowing out of my life, but that's not always what happens. And Jesus is going to give us a clue here out as to how to make that connection to have those things happen. And so uh, it says he was, he tells the disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. You notice that? Pray that you may not enter into temptation. You ever deal with temptation, Christian? Never, right? No, not me. Other people, yes. If my, you know, it's like if my husband was here to hear this message, he's always dealing with temptation. Or if my wife was here to hear this message, she always dealing with, or my kids or my cousin or my friend, oh, they really need to hear about this. Well, guess what? You do too. I do too. And anytime you have that type of thought, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this, apply it to yourself first. Right? So Jesus says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. So what is one way that we can avoid temptation? Pray. Yeah, but notice Jesus is praying before the, the event happens. He's telling the disciples, pray now before, right? So you can't be in the middle of temptation and then throw up the prayer and go, you know, oh, God, help me. Oh, it's too late. I already went down that road. I was too far down the road. And I prayed, but God didn't help me. Because you were 95% down the road. Did you pray before, right? Let me give you an example. I know that I have a tendency to get frustrated and upset when doing like home improvement projects. I am the guy that would take everybody else a half hour to do it. It's going to take me seven and a half hours to do it because something inevitably goes wrong. There's no stud in the wall. There's no, uh, my saw breaks, something goes wrong. And I'm always thinking, oh, this is going to be great. I got this. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to get it. And then something goes wrong and I'm mad, I'm angry, and I'm offending everybody in the house. How could I avoid that temptation? Well, pray before I start and realize that like, okay, something's bound to happen. I'm just going to pray. Lord, help me with this. I know I'm bound to get upset. Something's going to go wrong. And then, you know, I find that when I do that, Things go a lot smoother, not always with the project, but with me personally, spiritually, and affecting other people around me. Because you realize that when you give in to temptation, typically you're not just harming yourself. Your anger affects other people. Your frustration affects other people. The decision you made with that girl affects other people. The decision you made at that party could affect other people. There's, there's here near our house down the road, a couple weeks back, there was an accident. A guy was driving 100 miles an hour on a 45 mile an hour zone. He lost control of his car, careened through a fence, actually went through about five fences, and he ran over two toddlers who were playing in a sandbox, killed them both. His temptation, his giving into his temptation, it led to someone else being harmed. I doubt the guy woke up that morning and said, I want to go out get high on meth, drive and crash my car and kill a couple toddlers. He didn't start his day that way. But the temptation to use the drugs, the temptation to drive fast because he was late for something or whatever the case may be, it led to the direct harming of somebody else and affecting somebody else. Now, I don't know what where that guy's at or what he was thinking or what he was doing, but, you know, if we're considering these things beforehand, praying about them and not giving into temptation, Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. If you, if you lose your life for my sake, you'll gain it. But if you hold on to your life, trying to save it, that you're actually going to lose it. And so one way we can avoid temptation or going down the road of that temptation is through prayer. Notice it says, Jesus was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw away. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, 
Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This is the pressing right here. That Jesus is going through a pressing in the place of pressing. It's a spiritual pressing. And I truly believe what happened here during this time of prayer is where the battle was won. Because Jesus, at, at the end of this, John's gospel tells us he gets up from this time of prayer his cap, and he tells the, the, I think it's Matthew's gospel tells us that he tells the disciples, hey, rise and pray. The betrayer's here. They've come to get me. Then he looks in John's gospel. He tells us that he looks at the, those that are coming to get him. And he says, who are you looking for? And they say, oh, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, huh, that's me. Here I am. Right. So you get a whole picture again when you read all the gospels. But the battle was won in prayer. And I think we're going to, you're going to see that here. So Jesus says, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. What cup is he talking about? Is a cup of water? This is the cup of God's wrath that is going to be poured out upon Jesus while he's going through this passion, while he's getting scourged and while he goes to the cross and while he's suffering and being spit on and punched and all the things that happened to him. There's a cup of God's wrath that is being poured out upon him. And he says, Father, if there's any other way, any other way, there's anything we can do, but take this cup from me. I don't want to go through this. And then he says words that we would all be well to live by. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Right? What did Jesus teach to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not my will, but your will. And that's what he's saying. Hey, if there's any other way to do this, I'd, I'd prefer that. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And you know what? There was no other way. If there was another way, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. Anybody who tries to tell you that there's any other way is blasphemous. There, you're saying, by saying that there's another way, I can earn my way to heaven. I, I can score enough points to get there with God. I can do enough good things. I can go through this religious uh, ritual, and that'll make me right with God. No, it won't. By saying that, you're saying that Jesus didn't have to die on the cross, or Jesus' death on the cross was not enough. But the Bible says that it was enough. And when Jesus died, he says, it is finished. The story's done. There's nothing else that needs to happen. So there's a lot of religious groups around that say, oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross, but you need to do this, this, and that. No, you don't. They're ripping you off and it's usually for money or some other gain that the leaders of that organization benefit. All you need is is to place your trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And if I keep going, we're never going to get there because I'm detouring down bunny trails here. So Jesus says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then Luke's gospel is the only one that records this. It says, an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. It doesn't tell us this is like Gabriel, the uh the messenger angel, or this is Michael, the archangel. This is just some garden variety angel who shows up to minister to Jesus. And that's what it tells us in Hebrews. The angels are put forth to minister to those who are believers. They're there to comfort, to strengthen, to encourage. We don't know exactly how that works. I personally have never seen an angel that I know of, except for my wife over there, my little angel. But, uh, but no, I've never seen an angel. I don't know, you know, there's accounts of people in the Bible seeing an angel in their, uh, you know, appearing to them at the, at the tomb of Jesus. There's angels that appeared there, right? Uh, the angel appeared to uh, John the Baptist's dad, Zechari Zechariah. And an angel appeared to Mary. Uh, so they did appear, but I've never seen one. And, but an angel appears to Jesus from heaven and strengthens him. Now, how, again, let me keep going. So it says, verse 44, and being in agony, that would be Jesus being in agony, 
what did he do? He threw in the towel? He quit? He said, I'm not, I'm not going to go through with this anymore? No, it says he prayed more earnestly. How's that? That's when, when Jesus was in agony, and he hasn't even been beaten, crucified, scourged yet, and he's in agony. He's in agony at this thought of having the sin of the world poured upon him and being judged for it. The thought that he knows is coming, where he's going to be separated for a moment in time for the, from the Father for the first and only time in all of history. He's in agony over this. And that word agony, it means severe mental and emotional distress. And it's hard for us to, to wrap our minds around the fact that Jesus is in severe mental and emotional distress. But here's what I want you to know. The angel came, strengthened him. He was in agony over this. And Jesus being in the severe mental and emotional distress, you know what he did? He didn't quit. He didn't lay in bed for weeks. He didn't go to the doctor and get a pill. He didn't commit suicide. Instead, he prayed more earnestly. And I, I say that because there's a lot of people who going through a lot of things in life who are going through severe emotional and uh, mental distress, this type of agony, and the, the sort of natural response is to not want to get out of bed. I just want to lay in bed and just feel, feel sorry for myself or, or mope in my feelings here. Or I want to go somewhere and I want to get a pill to make this go away. Or I want to grab a bottle and hope that makes it disappear. And when none of that works, I'll, I'll ta talk to a friend, but that didn't work or the friend didn't have the right answer for me. And so instead I'm going to go and I'm going to commit suicide. That's not the answer. Jesus gives us the what to do when we're in severe mental and emotional distress. And I'm not discounting the fact that people have that and that it's real and that sometimes medication is needed to help those things or talking to a therapist or whatever uh, to give you, help you get some good coping skills. But you would do yourself a huge benefit if you would take Jesus's uh, lead and you would pray more earnestly and you would pray what maybe you need to go to therapy pray who to go to therapy with when to go to therapy what place should you go to lead me to the right spot help me to find people that will get me through this or whatever but when Jesus was in this severe mental and emotional distress, and later he's also in severe physical distress, along with the mental and emotional, his response was to pray. His response was not to back away from God's plan for his life. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Still hard to think about. I don't want to go through this, but I know this is what you have for me, and I'm going to pray all the way through it. And so notice he prayed more earnestly, verse 44, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And I, I think this is called hematidosis or something like that. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but it's, it's essentially where the capillaries around the sweat glands on your forehead begin to burst and it mingles with the sweat and it can be caused by a medical condition but it can also be caused when someone is under a great deal of emotional turmoil uh, and the, the sweat and the blood mix and begin to pour down. And apparently it's not, it's not really uh, like harmful to you physically, but it's really scary to look at. <laughs> and so you can imagine the scene. And then it says, notice verse 45, when he rose up from prayer and we're told again in the other gospels that this is three times. Jesus went in, told the disciples pray. He went a little further with Peter and John, tells them to pray. And then he comes back and finds them sleeping and he goes a second time and prays. And he comes back and finds them sleeping again. He goes a third time and prays. And then he finally, the last time he wakes them up and says, you know, that's it. We're, my captors are here. And so... He rises up, he comes to the disciples, and notice it says he finds them sleeping from sorrow. That's an interesting insight, right? Because 
we have Jesus who's in sorrow and emotional turmoil and distress, and he is praying more earnestly. The disciples are doing what a lot of us tend to do when we're sort of upset and depressed. I'm just going to stay in bed and pull the covers up over my head, and I'm going to sleep some more. Well, Jesus, he's going to give them some good advice that we should take too. He said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. That, that's a great word, right? How many of you raise hands, right? I'm sleeping. I mean, I'm, I'm going to pray and I've got in my mind or I've got my prayer list and you sit down to pray. And what's the first thing that happens? Heavenly Father, Oh, God. bless my family. Okay, I got to pray, got to pray, got to pray. All right. Jesus, what does Jesus say? I'm guilty too, by the way. What does Jesus say? Rise and pray. It's a lot harder to fall asleep if you get up. If you have a problem praying while you're laying down, stand up and try. If that, that's too hard and you feel like you're going to fall over and be a danger to yourself by falling asleep standing up, then go for a walk and pray. That's even harder to fall asleep. The point is, Jesus says, pray, do it. The point, do what it takes to pray. They're they're sleeping because of sorrow, we're told. He says to them, rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Jesus is continuing to give them this warning. Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Peter is really going to enter into temptation. But we're also told at one point that all of the disciples flee because they're all afraid. They all deny him in one way by fleeing. Peter was just the most vocal about it. And so he says, rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. So the Bible tells us that there is no temptation that is not common to man and that with every temptation, God will provide you a way of escape, right? Not with every trial, but with every temptation, right? What does that mean? It means, you know, if I've got a, a, an issue with um, sexual morality and I'm, you know, starting to walk down a road that I shouldn't be going, that there's always some sort of escape from that temptation, whether that be you get a knock on the door, someone gives you a phone call, you remember something else that you had to do, you, you just simply turn off your computer or your TV or whatever it might be, and you go do something else that you don't go down that road of temptation. There's a temptation if you're a business person to do shady business dealings and rip people off. But there's also going to be a way out for you to not do that. And so... Part of the way that we discern those ways out is by our time in prayer. You spend this time in prayer, rise and pray lest you enter into temptation, that when these temptations or these tests come, we recognize them for what they are and we're able to flee from them like Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife when she tried to to seduce him and he just left his robe and everything behind and took off running. That's a great example in Genesis if you go back and read about the life of Joseph, about a man who was tempted, who already had in his mind that I'm going to flee this temptation. I'm not going to sin against my master, and I'm not going to sin against my God. I'm out of here. And so here's what else is cool. Hebrews uh, 4, chapter 15. So Hebrews, I mean, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. It says, Speaking of Jesus, and what's going on here in Hebrews is that the author of Hebrews is saying, Jesus is better than the law. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than Joshua. Jesus is better than the priesthood uh, of the Jews. And so in Hebrews 4.15, speaking of Jesus, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows, when he's telling them to get up and pray that you don't enter into temptation, he knows 
because he's been through it. We're told right here that he's in severe mental and emotional distress, and yet he's giving the example, I'm going to pray more earnestly, and I'm telling you to pray, and I'm giving the, giving the example. He's been in our shoes. So when Jesus tells you when you're in severe emotional distress to pray more, he's been there. He knows what you're going through. He's been in our shoes, so to speak, as a human being. That's one of the reasons it's so important that Jesus came as a human being to reach human beings because we can identify with him. We can know that he's been through what we've been through. We see in the Gospels that Jesus was hungry, that he was tired, that he was upset over circumstances of life. And here we see that he's in turmoil and distress over the crucifixion. He knows what it's like to be in our shoes our Jesus is a great comforter. Our Jesus is a great high priest because he has been through what we've been through, except he never failed. He never gave in to the temptation, but he's a great example. Not giving in to the temptation doesn't mean that you haven't been tempted. Remember? And, and so Jesus, we, we see the account of him tempted by Satan out in the wilderness. He responded with the word of God. Another great response to temptation. Verse 47. <clears throat> While he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Right? And so, remember, Judas said to the religious leaders back uh, earlier in the chapter, verse 6, he promised after being agreeing to this 30 pieces of silver, he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So he knows now it's the common place they were accustomed to going with Jesus into this garden of Gethsemane to pray. He knows that after the meal, I bet we can find him over there praying. And so Judas takes this detachment of of troops or guards and, and he goes over there into the garden and he betrays Jesus with a kiss. That was the sign that this is the one. And why did Jesus had one of the biggest ministries ever known in the history of the world? He was popular. Thousands of people were following him. People had witnessed these miracles. And what why did he need to be betrayed with a kiss? How come he needed to be identified? Well, Isaiah tells him that there was, tells us that there was nothing comely about him. There was nothing that made him stand out in a crowd. Like Saul, King Saul, when he was chosen to be king, it says that Saul was, was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. Everybody knew, wow, there's Saul because he's this huge man. They said Jesus was just an average guy. He looked like every other Jewish man of that time. Probably had a beard, a little bit longish hair, brown, olive skinned, right? He, he looked like a Mediterranean man of the day. There, there was nothing like really like he didn't have the halo that we always see in pictures. There wasn't angels singing behind him as he went. And he just was like a normal guy. So much so that even with his popularity, he still had to point him out in a crowd. And so Judas goes with this detachment of troops and he betrays Jesus with a kiss. And when you think about a kiss, this is a greeting common to, you see it a lot in Hispanic cultures. You see it in other places around the world. The United States, we're real cold. We like to shake hands and that's about it. But in these other cultures around the world, they come in and they give you a little kiss on the cheek on both sides. And you know, they, these the little greetings that they say and, and it, it's a warm, inviting thing. It's an intimate thing. You still wouldn't necessarily do this with a stranger, but someone you know, this was a way of going up and, and greeting with a kiss. And so Judas walks up to Jesus in this way and gives him a little, you know, and Jesus says to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? You know, Judas' name means praise. Interesting, Judah the, the tribe of Judah means praise, and Judas is a take on the name Judah. It means praise. 
Parents typically named their kids at birth for what they hoped they would be. This either this kid brought a lot of praise into our family because we weren't expecting to have him, or he is going to grow up and cause people to praise God. And so he's he's violating his namesake at this point. So he says, Judas, are you betraying the Messiah, the Son of Man, with a kiss? In, in one of the other Gospels recorded that at this point, Jesus calls him friend. He didn't say, you weasel you. I always knew you wore that black coat and had that mustache and, and, and the little goatee and you were just a son of the devil the whole time. You never had a chance, Judas. No, Jesus loved him. When he washed the disciples' feet, that's recorded in John 13, Judas' feet got washed too, even knowing that he was going to betray him. He had dinner, right? Speaking of temptation and a way out, at the Last Supper meal, when they're all asking, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. Judas already knows at that point that it's him. That would be a point for him to have a way out, to say, oh Lord, I made a mistake. I, I went to the religious leaders and I said I was going to betray you. And oh, can, how can you ever forgive me? And Jesus, you know what? He would have forgiven him right there. He washed his feet. He loved him. He said another chance for escape. They said, who is it? Who's going to betray you? And said, the one I'm, I'm eating the bread with. And at that moment, they're probably dipping in the bread together or in the, dipping their bread in the, the oil together. And you think like at that moment, Judas and Jesus and probably like, that's another moment he could have said, oh, I made a huge mistake, Lord. I'm sorry. I got greedy. I wanted that money. I just, I didn't understand. And now I, I realize I blew it. How, can you ever forgive me? And you know what? Jesus would have forgiven him. But he just kept going down that road of temptation. The road for money. We're told he was a thief. He was into the finer things, apparently. Remember when, when Mary was going to pour out the costly oil of spikenard and Judas said, oh, he's the one that led the charge. What a waste. That could, have, that could have taken care of a year's wages and blah, blah, blah. We could have done so much good with that. And Jesus defended Mary, but Judas was, he was concerned about the money. Right? And here he's concerned about the money. And so now he's come to Jesus and he's betraying him with a kiss. And now look at what happens. When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? So they asked the question. Remember, they had two swords. They found them, right? After Jesus said, get a sword. So we know they found at least two. And we know Peter had one of them. But they say, should we strike with the sword? Right? They see what's happening now. Oh, this detachment's come. They're going to take Jesus. And Peter uh, uh, Judas now I'm sure the light bulbs have come on and they're kind of like oh he's the one and they come out and they get these swords and they say what should we do should we strike him with the sword and then notice what happens next and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear the, they didn't wait for an answer they asked Jesus but then they acted Some, we need to learn how to wait for the answer this, that's what struck me when I read this is we need to wait for answers because had they waited for the answer, Jesus would have said, no, no, these things must come to pass. But instead they cause damage. Peter gets up and we know from the other gospel, this is Peter and he cuts off the high priest servant's ear, whose name is Malchus. And Peter like wakes up from sleep. Uh, what? <laughs> He's, you know, he was aiming for the guy's head, but all he got was the ear. And it, he didn't wait for the answer. He just got up. I'm ready to die with you. Yeah, he was. But we'll see in a minute. He couldn't live for him. And so here's what happens. Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. How did that go? Malchus is coming out there ready to take Jesus and ready to take him off to be tried and crucified and killed and all this, whatever they were going to do. And now all of a sudden he's the recipient of a miracle. He probably thought, he's probably scared to death. I mean, you can imagine look like today's world. Someone pulls out a gun and they pull the trigger and it blows off your ear instead of your head. And you're like, oh, I should be dead. That should have been my head. But now I'm, I'm missing an ear. 
And Jesus goes, just give me a second here. He touches him and his ear is healed. You think Malchus was still all about killing Jesus at that point? I think he probably had a changed heart. He's probably like, hey, guys, I'm gonna, th- thanks for the ear. I'm going to skip out. I'm out of here. I'm going to go home, watch Netflix or whatever, you know. I, I don't think... I don't think that Malchus's heart was the same after Jesus touched him. Again, another lesson for us about Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those who spitefully use you, pray for those who use you, right? So here, not only is he being kind with Judas, but then he could have said, man, you're coming out here to kill me. Let you go around with one ear. Look like a Picasso painting, okay? But... Instead, he heals the man. He touches him, his enemy. He heals him. Do you know what that probably did in Malchus's heart? That's, that's the, like where the Bible talks about, um, it, you know, being kind to your enemies. And by doing that, that you use like heaping coals of fire on their head. They can't understand why you would do something so kind for them when they've been doing nothing but evil to you. And it changes people's hearts. I can almost guarantee, it doesn't tell us in the scriptures, but I can almost guarantee that Malchus's heart was changed after this. He probably was later on one of the part of the early church. And I'm just speculating that, but how could you not be? You came out there to kill this guy, to take him away, to be tried unlawfully. And he, in the middle of all of this, he heals you. And not only did he heal Malchus, but he also covered up Peter's blunder. And Jesus is good at that with us, too, because we make a lot of blunders in life, but he is good at covering our blunders. Don't go make blunders on purpose. But if you're like Peter, zealous in the moment, you're trying to help. And instead of bringing healing, you end up cutting off an ear. Jesus is able to cover your blunders. But we need that time in prayer and spending time with him that we have the right word from the spirit that we're not using the sword of the spirit to cut off ears because if we're cutting people's ears off with the word of god then guess what they don't hear anything you say and so verse 51 but jesus answered and said permit even this and he touched his ear and healed him verse 52 then jesus said to the chief priests the captains of the temple and the elders who had come to him have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs when i was with you daily in the temple you did not try to seize me but this is your hour and the power of darkness another translation i think it's the niv says This is your hour when darkness reigns. And I like that translation because it makes that a little bit clearer. Jesus says, I was there every day of this last week. I've been in the temple teaching and among the people. And you never even tried to come and talk to me. And now you come out here like I'm some kind of robber and thief with all these swords and detachment of troops. But you know what? It's your hour. The hour of darkness is here. Go ahead and do what you got to do, right? Again, I love the other gospels. John's gospel, they says, he says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, here I am. And they just all, it's like something emitted from him and they all fell on the ground when he said that. And then they're on the, they're on the ground and Jesus says to them again, I asked who you're looking for. He <laughs> said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I told you, that's me, right? But it's your time. It's, it's the hour has come. And so verse 54, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now, what I want you to know, this is like the middle of the night. They're bringing him to the high priest's house to put him on trial for violation of religious law in the middle of the night. That is a violation of their own Talmud. The Talmud said that the trials had to be in the day, in the open. So basically anybody could witness this goings on. Now notice what it says. Peter followed at a distance. This is a bad spot to be. Be a Christian following Jesus at a distance. That's not where you want to be. And I think it's, Oh, don't let me don't let me lie in church. I, 
one of the other gospels tells us that, that it's John. It's actually John's gospel, I believe. John was with him at this point. There was some connection where John was able to get them into this courtyard. Uh, and so Peter's following at a distance. Now verse 55 says, When they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Again, the other gospels tell us that at this time, Peter is sitting there at a distance, warming himself at the fire. And you think like, well, what, what's the big deal? Well, Jesus is follow. I mean, Peter's following Jesus at a distance. And now he's huddled around with the quote unquote enemy, warming himself by the enemy's fire. When we follow Jesus at a distance, sometimes the enemy's fire seems like it's a good thing. It's kind of warm. Maybe, maybe I'll stay here for a bit. It's, it's attractive rather than being where Jesus is at. And so look what happens while Peter's around the fire. A certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently and said, this man was also with him. So this word looked intently, like this is like she's glaring at him. She's giving him one of those. Those kind of stares that like when you're in the mall or the airport or something and you kind of look up and somebody's like staring at you and you're like, something I should know, buddy. Do I have like a booger on my face or what? And, and, and then, or sometimes people are doing that. And then all of a sudden they get this, like, do I, do I know you from somewhere? You look familiar. You know, what high school did you go to or that kind of thing? Right. And, and you're like, ah, I've never, never, never seen you before in my life, pal. Right. And, but Peter's this, this, that's the look this girl's giving this intent glare, this look. And, she says, this servant girl says, this man was also with him, speaking of Jesus. But he, that's Peter, denied him, Jesus. So Peter denies Jesus, saying, woman, I do not know him. That's number one, mark it in your Bible. Jesus said he was going to deny him three times before the rooster crows. So that's number one. And after a little while, another saw him and said, you, are, you also are of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. How many is that? Two times. Then after about an hour had passed, so now he's got these two times are down. He's warming himself by the fire. An hour has gone by. And nobody else has said anything. He's like, okay, I can just relax now until... Another, notice this, confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. <clears throat> the other Gospels tell us that it was Peter's accent that gave him away as being from the Galilee area. It's my understanding that the Galilee area was sort of like a hick town, you know, whereas Jerusalem was kind of like the big city, right? So if you were from Galilee, maybe you say y'all and talk like this as opposed to being in the city and talking more proper or something. There was a little more slang happening out there in Galilee. And so they recognized that Peter's from Galilee. They were told by his accent. And they said, oh, this guy has to be with him. Because, and uh, I, again, I think one of the other Gospels says that this person that's confronting Peter was a relative of Malchus who was there in the garden. And so he, like, I saw you there. You, you, the, your accent's giving you away, but I know I saw you there. There's no more proof, but you cut my cousin's ear off. Right? That's, that's kind of the idea of what's going on. So Peter said, man, I don't know what you are saying. And again, the other Gospels tell us that at this point, Peter begins to curse and swear. And I don't want you to think like, like a rap song, cursing and swearing. He's, he's, Cursing, like calling down curses upon himself. I swear that I don't know him. And if I'm lying, then let me be cast into the deepest part of hell. Right? That's, that's sort of the idea of what's, what he's saying. And so notice again, just like we talked about before, let's build a booth for you, Jesus, and one for uh, Moses and one for Elijah. And it said there at that time when Peter was still speaking that he got interrupted by God. This time, 
while he's still speaking, he's interrupted by a rooster. And it says, while he was still speaking, cock a doo doo doo, the rooster crows. And at this point, Peter's like, oh, look what happens. Verse 61, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Wow. As soon as that rooster crowed, Peter was like crushed. And he looks at the Lord. Or I should say the Lord looked at him. Right? That rooster crows and it's almost like Jesus was just waiting for the rooster to crow and then he looks at Peter. And I want you to think in your own mind, when you hear that, when you hear that the rooster crowed and Jesus looked at Peter, how did Jesus look at Peter? In your own mind, I want you to think, how did Jesus look at Peter? Now that you formulated that, do you think Jesus looked at Peter in anger and disgust? I knew it knew you were going to blow it. I told you, you didn't rise and pray. You didn't, all you did was sleep, you lazy bum. Let me just tell you, if you think that that's the way that Jesus looked at Peter, you know a different Jesus than I know. Because Jesus gave Peter the warning. This is going to happen, Peter, but I've already prayed for you. Peter did not disappoint Jesus because Jesus already knew it was going to happen. Peter disappointed himself. He disappointed himself that he went down this road of temptation. That he what? Remember how full of pride he was? I'm ready to go to prison and to death. I'm never do that. Watch out if that's you. If you're in that sort of a, a mental state, I'll never do that. I'll never do that. Watch out. You're right around the corner from a from a rooster crowing incident. Jesus told Peter what was going to happen. Peter didn't believe it. Jesus looked at Peter, and I bet the look was just a look of compassion, a look of understanding. Remember, he's a high priest that's been tempted in every way as we have yet without sin. He knows what Peter was going through, the fear, whatever that was in his mind, and he's sad. He's, he's, he, it's like a, like a parent watching your kid make a mistake. They don't always let you down in terms of, I know my kid's going to do this. But then they make the mistake and they get caught. And then you're like, you're not, you can't even be mad at them because you knew this was going to happen. But they're disappointed in themselves. They feel like they've let you down. But Jesus, again, and this would apply to us too, if you've ever denied Jesus by your actions, you didn't let him down. He already knew what was going to happen. What he would say is, don't let your faith fail, and when you return, strengthen the brethren, right? That's what he told Peter. I would think it would be the same for us, too, or maybe it's a different instruction. But Jesus, you're never letting him down. He's always aware of what's in your heart. He knows what's in man. You can't let God down. You can let yourself down. You can let your parents down. You can let your pastor down, your friends down. But you can't let God down because he already knows everything. What he wants from you is all of you. And right here, I think this is, this is an example with Peter. His actions led to his complete brokenness and repentance that made him an able minister moving forward. This, bro this moment of brokenness. Later on, Jesus restores him. Judas blows it. Both men blow it. Later on, Judas, after he sees what's happening, he, he's sorry and he, he wants to give the 30 pieces of silver back. And they're like, no, no, we don't take that's yours. It's on you now. And Judas, rather than repenting at his sorrow, he goes and, and hangs himself. There was no repentance with Judas. He was just sorry. There's a big difference between being sorry and being repentant. Repentant is a turn from action. It's a 180 degree turn away from what you were doing. Sorry is just like, well, if I hadn't got caught, I wouldn't even be worried about it. 
But since I got caught, now I'm sorry. And so what happens? Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. So I just want to point out real quick that if you're blindfolded and punched in the face, you cannot react. If I, you know, if I'm, someone's coming at me to hit me, they might still hit me, but I'm able to deflect the blow by going like this or duck a little bit or go do one of these. If you're blindfolded, you don't know when it's coming and you can't defend yourself against it. That's why like in football, a blindside hit on a quarterback can do a lot of devastation to the quarterback because they never saw it coming. But if the guy's coming from the front, he could be three times as big as the quarterback, but you can brace for the impact and it doesn't do as much damage. Jesus, we're told in Isaiah, his face was marred beyond recognition. This is why. He's blindfolded and punched in the face. You don't even know it's coming. You just And then look at what they do, the mocking. They say, prophesy. Tell us who struck you. Well, I'm going to tell you that these guys have a wrong understanding of what prophecy is. Prophecy is not all about foretelling the future or like a genie, like, oh, someone's going to, you know, I see that you're going to hit me, right? The prophecy is, is speaking forth the word of God, and Jesus has already done that. And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. And as soon as it was day, so now after this illegal trial where he's been beaten and punched and whatnot, now the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the scribes, they come together. They lead him into their council. Now they're trying to give him the, the real trial. He's already a little beat up. I mean, you don't think that they would notice that? If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe me. And if I ask you, and if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, you rightly say that I am. And they said, what further testimony do we need? We've heard it. For ourselves from his own mouth <clears throat> so Jesus doesn't answer them initially he says if I tell you you're not going to believe me then hereafter you're gonna see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power of God when he says that he's saying the next time you see me it's gonna be in the place of judgment I'm going to be judging you but then they recognize when he says that he's the Son of Man that he is the son of God. There's no question in their mind as to what Jesus meant when he said, I'm the son of man, that he was also claiming to be the son of God. And he says, well, you said it. And then the, their response, well, that's all we need. Yep, we're, he's convicted under the religious law. Keep that in mind. He's convicted under the religious law, blasphemy, guilty of death, but because they're under the Roman thumb, they do not have the power to put people to death for Jewish law. There has to be a violation of Roman law that is subject to the death penalty according to Roman law. So when he goes to Pilate for the next trial and later to Herod for another trial and then back to Pilate, it's all about making up charges to have him in violation of Roman law so they can have him killed according to Roman law, because under religious law, they had had that right taken away when they were put under the Roman thumb. So they're looking for, they're convicting him according to religious law in their religious kangaroo court here, but now they're going to have to take him from there over to Pilate, to ha who's the, the governor of that area, to have him tried in Pilate's court, to s have Pilate say he violated Roman law and can be put to death. And so they're making all of this up as they go. And that's what we're going to see as it continues prior to Jesus being crucified. So let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word and just for how you teach us through it. And I pray tonight that if there is those that are struggling with uh, emotional distress and turmoil, that uh, we take your example, Lord, and that there would be just more earnest prayer and more seeking your face and 
pray that our hearts will be committed to your kingdom come and your will be done, even if it doesn't line up with ours or what we think we should happen or what we want to happen, but that we would do what your will is. And Jesus, thank you that you were willing to go through all of this suffering, that you were led as a lamb to the slaughter for our sake, our benefit. And I pray that you would just allow these things to sink into our hearts tonight, that we would be those who are seeking your face. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.